Shalom. This week we are reading Parashat Ha'azinu, the song of Moshe. And this Shabbat is Shabbat Shuva, the Sabbath of repentance, the Sabbath that falls between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And on this Shabbat we are totally focused on our spiritual quest on this beautiful cosmic process of renewal and introspection and realignment that has begun for us. We came through Rosh Hashanah now, the beginning of the, of the new year, with its theme of the recognition of the sovereignty of God and our uh, position as subjects of the King. And now, during this whole period of the Days of Repentance, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we are honing and refining this theme within our lives, the theme of our own revitalization and renewal, our own efforts to reconnect with all of the spiritual underpinnings of our Torah, with everything that we believe in and hold to be true and dear and precious, and we are just looking at ourselves in a whole different way, our relationship with Hashem, our relationship with each other. This is a time of great upheaval, in a positive way, of great spiritual flux. And everything about everything that we are doing during these days of repentance takes it to consideration and is a part of and a reflection of and a manifestation of this tremendous churning, a yearning process that we're in of facing Hashem with renewed strengths and vigor and realization of our potential. So on this Shabbat, the Shabbat of repentance, we are reading the penultimate Torah portion. We are reading the Song of Moshe, Parshat Ha'azinu, beginning in chapter 32, and actually, on the simplest level, it's so fitting and beautiful because who wouldn't like to think of their life as being a song? In our more poetic or romantic moments, we think of ourselves perhaps as notes in a vast uh, orchestration. We like to look at life as being a song, and we try to find ourselves within that song. And everybody has a song to sing. In fact, creation itself sings a song. This is a great secret in the Torah, and indeed the Torah has a number of songs, ten songs altogether is the tradition, and this song is one of the most beautiful and famous, and really Moshe, who is the great maestro, conductor of the Jewish people. His life's work was certainly a song, and Israel is really his song. He was the loving conductor and craftsman and the notes that he forged are really each soul of the Jewish people. Now actually what's interesting is that Moshe himself is identified with song. Moshe in Exodus 15 sang the song, led Israel in the song of the crossing of the sea, which is such a phenomenal, a pivotal, um, foundational part of the Torah, the understanding of what the Song of the Sea is all about, that vision of the, rest of the res resurrection of the dead, that whole idea of what the people of Israel saw, the great level of prophecy when they came through the Sea of Reeds. And in fact, um, not only is Moshe identified with that song, but that song is actually, according to our sages, that, that song in Exodus 15, is actually one of the proofs, as it were, that there will be a time when God will resurrect all of the dead. Because in the Hebrew there, in Exodus 15, the words don't actually read, as is commonly translated, then sang Moshe and the children of Israel, but the words actually read, then Moshe and the children of Israel will sing this song, and that is to say that Moshe one day will lead the children of Israel in that very song again, Exodus 15. Actually, not only is Moshe identified with song, 
But the Torah itself is called a song. And in fact, in last week's Torah portion, the second of the double Torah portion that we read last week, towards the end of uh, Parshat Vayelech, we actually have the commandments. It's actually the second to the last of the 613 commandments that are listed in the Torah. We actually have the commandment to write a Torah scroll. It is a commandment for every single member of Israel to write for himself a Torah scroll. And there in Parshat Vayelech we read, so now write this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Place it in their mouth so that this song shall be for me a witness a witness against the children of Israel. So there we have the mitzvah, the positive commandment of writing a Torah scroll and the wording of the commandment is write for yourselves this song. So the Torah itself is a song, but here in our Torah portion on this Shabbat of repentance, in Parshat Ha'azinu, in the song of Moshe, this actually of all the songs of the Torah is considered by our great tradition to be really its own, its own category. It is the most exalted of all the songs. It is actually from a uh, literal, from a, from, a, from a literature, if we could say such a thing, point of view. It is the most exalted form of poetry. It's full of very strong imagery. It is replete with tremendous depth of feeling and emotion and lofty thought. It is um, structured in a very precise manner. It consists of 70 stanzas. And everyone, all of the commentators and all of the great uh, insight into our Torah, everyone acknowledges the strength of the expression and the depth of the concepts that this song, the song of Ha'azinu, expresses is unsurpassed in the whole Torah. Just as far as its pure uh, poetry, its style, its imagery. But on a simple level, this song, the final rebuke of Moshe, because after this song we go on to the blessing, which actually is also somewhat of a rebuke, in Vezot HaBracha, in the actual last Torah portion. And it's interesting that on a simple level, <clears throat> this song is actually somewhat severe. So, separating from the praise and the um, acknowledgement and admiration of the powerful style and form <clears throat> and emotion that's expressed by this song, it's actually a heavy kind of trip that Moshe was laying on the people of Israel. It's a severe situation. This, again, continuation of the, <coughs> the last day of Moshe Rabbeinu. And he's giving over something on a very profound level. And his major concern that we've seen for some time now is the future of Israel and the precise and intimate knowledge that he possessed that Israel would be constantly struggling with this um, insubordinate kind of character trait, this backsliding. And here, in Parshat Ha'azinu, Moshe Rabbeinu warns Israel, and this is how the song opens, he literally warns Israel that after I'm gone, don't think that you're going to be able to come up with some kind of excuse that, well, I didn't accept this covenant upon myself. He says, I'm going to call witnesses that will never be absentee, that you'll never be able to pull one over on. He warns Israel that he is now calling heaven and earth themselves to witness that they indeed have entered into this covenant and that they will always collectively and individually bear responsibility for this, and there's no turning back. And the song, and I say again that it's on the simple level, seems to be somewhat severe at points. It 
does feature a great deal of rebuke and chastisement and visions of Israel's future backsliding. But it also contains God's uh, consolation of Israel after detailing the subsequent wrath that will follow the backsliding, it certainly informs us of Hashem's consolation of Israel and the ultimate redemption. But on a deeper level, there's something absolutely amazing about this song. And that is the tradition that our sages teach us that this song was actually constantly recited in the Holy Temple every Shabbat by the Levites. Indeed, there is a tradition that our sages discuss in Tractate Rosh Hashanah of the, of the Talmud that explains how this song, Parshat Ha'azinu, was actually divided into six segments. And as part of the additional service which the Musaf service, which is actually an elevation of holiness, and it is the climax of holiness in the Holy Temple, the additional service on Shabbat, this song was actually divided into six sections, and, was, and a section of it, a part of it, was sung each Shabbat, meaning that there was a six-week cycle in the Beit HaMikdash, in the Holy Temple, wherein each week on Shabbat, this song was recited by the Levites. And this is an amazing idea, because if the song, which admittedly we appreciate its beauty, its literary value, as it were, if you could say such a thing about the Holy Torah, its poetry, its construct, we also understand the fact that it is somewhat, again, severe, that it contains elements of chastisement, of a certain sense of foreboding. And so if that is all that we understand about the song, we would be quite perplexed to try and understand the central position that it actually occupied in the, in the Holy Temple service. And again, everything that's going on in the Holy Temple is the very crux and core of reality. It's the tikkun for reality, and it's also the bridge that spans all generations. Everything going on in the Holy Temple has absolutely uh, unparalleled levels of meaning for all time. And so something about this song has such significance and conveys such eternal meaning that it was actually incorporated into the weekly service in the Holy Temple and what's more as part of the Musaf service on Shabbat. And why is this again so intriguing? Because the Levium, the Levitical choir, are themselves the descendants of Moshe. And so look at the iconography that is laid out before us here in the Torah, that Moshe is about to depart from his beloved people, the maestro, the conductor, who has spent his life, his life's work, perfecting the song of his group, of his orchestra, is about to depart. And as he is taking his leave, of Israel, after having taught them his song, he is giving them another song, and this one is going to be with them forever. It's going to be with them in the continuation of their existence all throughout the ages, in the future generations, in the holy temple that he was not able to see, that he was not able to be part of. His own lineal descendants, his veritably his children, the Levitical choir are going to be somehow representing him, somehow continuing his presence in the midst of Israel in the Holy Temple by reciting this song. And the best way for us to really appreciate this is by understanding that this song is not only a rebuke 
And it's not only a warning, but that there is a, a very beautiful tradition, which is personified here by the great sage, the Ramban, Nachmanides, and others, who explains that the main aspect of this song is that it is an all-encompassing prophecy. And that this song literally includes every detail of everything that will ever happen in the future and that will ever affect Israel and how Israel will affect these events. And it is literally a map. It is literally a sprawling, all-encompassing vision that Moshe, in his inimitable fashion as the maestro, laid out as a point of future reference for his people. And so there, no wonder that in the Holy Temple, which is essentially the headquarters for bringing about the redemption, for our participation in the unfolding saga of our own redemption, where everything that's going on there is parts of the program of bringing Hashem's knowledge and presence into this world, the Levium, who are carrying on for Moshe and the Holy Temple, are in essence perpetuating Moshe's presence amongst the people of Israel in the Holy Temple with a sort of holy and eternal mantra, Hazinu, the song that Moshe sang, which is not only calling heaven and earth to bear witness about Israel's responsibility and Israel's obligation and Israel's covenant, but also about Hashem's responsibility and obligation and covenant towards Israel and everything that He promised. And within the words of Ha'azina are couched in the most wondrous ways every detail of every sort of um, development along the long road towards redemption. And the study of Parshat Ha'azinu, which we are not really going to delve into now, this is not going to be uh, ultimate revelation of redemption class, but know that the level upon levels of meaning that are contained in Parshat Ha'azinu are themselves a lifetime of study. Every detail of, of every phrase all those expressions that we said that are so full of emotion and meaning and powerful imagery and lofty consciousness, they contain everything in the world that ever was and ever will be. And Moshe left that in the hands of the Levium to perpetuate his spirit, his guiding hand, his consciousness over his children in the Holy Temple as these words are recited and Israel begins to understand throughout the ages what the blueprint for redemption really is. And so now, on this Shabbat of repentance, as we look so deeply within ourselves and seek to actualize everything that we realized on Rosh Hashanah about ourselves, about Hashem, about our relationships and hope that we are going to be able to follow through and bring this into the year and into Yom Kippur and then into Sukkot and into the whole year and we think to ourselves how wonderful it would be to have that guiding figure of Moshe as he was so dedicated and so committed to his people. And we see from Parshat Ha'azinu that Moshe left us with this legacy of the imprint of Hashem's promises to the people of Israel and to the world. And that our task is to continue to participate and to reveal all of these promises so that Moshe himself will join us and sing this song and we will all resonate, each one of us representing our own individual note in that great song, which is the Torah itself, and you write for yourselves this song.